Thank you, Keith, for reminding me. <laughs> Boy, that was close. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago, Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 through 51. Exodus 12, 40 through 51. And as you're turning, I will try to get my breath back. You know, I'd like to see some of you try that. <laughs> In a short five-verse hymn, that was five verses, but it was short. Run all the way up to the balcony, running up the stairs, running all the way back down to the front of the balcony, turning on the internet equipment. You see, I'm stalling for time. <laughs> and then running back up, running down the stairs, running all the way up here, running up those stairs, running into the sound room, turning on the machines there for the CDs and the tapes, coming back down here and making it by the Amen. All right. Exodus chapter 12. Now, the last time we were in Exodus was a very long time ago. It was all the way back on March 13th. Here's your hat, what's your hurry, or come again when you can't stay so long, back in verses 31 through 39. Because in between there, we had Palm Sunday, that was March 20th, fig branches, palm trees, and whips. I'm so thankful for those of you who were there for that one on Palm Sunday. Then Good Friday, March 25th, hanging on a tree from Galatians 3, verses 1 through 13. Then on Resurrection Sunday, three special messages. Why seek the living among the dead from Luke 12, uh, 24, verses 1 through 12. Faith in the better resurrection, and that was the morning message. The first one was the sunrise service. And then the evening, marriage and the resurrection out of Luke chapter 20, verses 20 through 38, 27 through 38. Today we're looking at Passover forever, and we're going to discover that, of course, there's a tie-in with Good Friday and Palm Sunday and also Resurrection Sunday, because this is the point at which God establishes the Passover for the Jews as a nation forever, because it is a memorial, just like we're going to be partaking of the Lord's table this morning. That is a memorial of what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. And so indeed the theme fits very well with what we're doing today. Now you recall that the last time we were in Exodus back in March, March 13th, we had made some initial observations. We saw that God always fulfills his prophetic word precisely, exactly, completely, to the letter, and not allegorically, symbolically, mythologically, partially, haphazardly, or imprecisely. That's the way that God always fulfills prophecy and how he will fulfill the prophetic future as recorded in the book of Revelation, Daniel, and elsewhere in Scripture. We saw that in that context we can make at least eight observational, foundational observations on the text. Number one, sometimes it takes death that is close to you to get your attention and obedience. Number two, sometimes it takes the fear of your own death to get your attention and obedience. Oh my, how often God has had to use that throughout history, where people facing death had had to call out on him to be saved. They've heard it before, but they've rejected until they suddenly find themselves facing death. I hope that doesn't happen to you. Number three, sometimes it takes death to realize the sovereignty of God and that you want his blessing and not his curse. Number four, sometimes you will be driven to panic at the most inconvenient times because you didn't obey when you had the opportunity in the good times. There are many people like that too. They say, well, I don't really think it's that bad yet. Oh, don't wait until it gets terrible. We're facing some things like that in this country. It may come soon. Number five, when judgment falls, it will hit your family, it will hit you economically, and it will hit you personally. God spreads his judgment across a wide spectrum of places where it falls. Number six, when judgment falls, there will be no place to hide, not even in prison. Remember in the narrative here in our text in Exodus, the firstborn was struck not only of Pharaoh, but of the lowest prisoner in the lowest dungeon. Number seven, when judgment falls, it will hit the highest to the lowest. There's no respect of persons. Number eight, when judgment falls, you will not try to cut a deal with God. You will learn that you must obey in everything without argumentation. Pharaoh learned that. 
You don't wait for the judgment to fall and ravage the price with a pound of flesh closest to your heart. Obey now while you have a chance. We've just finished looking at the plagues of darkness and the plague of the death of the firstborn. The darkness of judgmental blindness, which was followed by death. And of course, I think, as I've told you before, I think the United States is on the cusp of judgment right now. And a judgment that will bring not just blindness, but death. We also saw that our text last time gave some hints about what we should do about it. We'll cover those briefly. We'll just run over them again in just a moment. We've seen a few key suggestions in the text that told us what to do to be prepared either for blessing or for national judgment. There's some things right there in the text that tells you what the children of Israel did at the command of God that prepared them for the exodus. To understand how to apply those suggestions, we emphasize that we must remember the rule that God has established, which is precise obedience, not haphazard obedience, not partial obedience, not ho-hum, lackadaisical, sloppy obedience. If we follow God's instructions with precision, we'll have his blessing. If we're sloppy or disobedient about following his instructions, we pay for it. Once you learn that lesson, you have to keep doing it. You can't just do it once and say, well, I did it once. It's a lifestyle that God wants us to develop. Pharaoh finally learned the lesson of exact obedience without trying to negotiate a deal, but he forgot it just as soon as he had learned it because he chased the Jews to the Red Sea. If you only obey when things are tough, you'll still find yourself under the sovereign judgment of God. You may have initially decided to obey when things got tough, but then when things loosened up a bit, you began to disobey again. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. It's not because he doesn't care anymore. It's because he wants you to have a changed life. We applied that principle to practical family life for the question, what happens to a child who knows the truth? You've told him. He can babble it back to you. He parrots it. Little children are like parrots. They can babble it right back to you. But then they don't obey. What happens to the child? Well, the book of Hebrews tells us, <laughs> uh, tells us whom the father loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, or of all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Verse 26 of Hebrews 10 says, For if we sin willfully, by the way, that's in the context of skipping church, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, in other words, you know it, but you're not doing it, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. And at the end of that passage it says, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. We don't like to hear those passages. We want to hear the fuzzy passages. We want to hear the ones that are like cotton candy, the ones that are sweet, the ones that tell us all about how good God is. And yes, the scripture is filled with that. But the scripture is also filled with the warnings for believers, not merely for those who are lost. Then we ask the application question, what excuses do you give to God? That is to God, not to yourself or to the family or to the pastor or other people. What excuses do you give to God for cutting out of church or being late to church? And that's the Hebrews 10 context where we just read those verses just a moment ago. God doesn't have a plan B. He has one plan, plan A. He tells us what he wants us to do. He expects us to do it. He's not going to compromise with us, just like he refused to compromise with Pharaoh. He refused to cut a deal with Pharaoh. He's not going to cut a deal with you. And we're certainly not any bigger or better than Pharaoh was. Also, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that God doesn't give me more light until I obey the light that I've already got. He's not going to show you the light for five steps down the path. He's going to show you the light for the next step that you have to take. And until you take that step, you don't get light for the next step. That's why many people remain in spiritual infancy is because they're still back here. They want to know everything about what's going to happen in the future, but they refuse to obey the present. God doesn't cut deals. He doesn't say, well, if you just give a little more money to the church, uh, then I'll let you know. Uh, I'll give you some hints about the farther down the road steps. 
He says, obey me now, do what I tell you now. It will provide the foundation that is necessary for you to understand the next step that I'm going to give you. Because the next step may be difficult and it would scare you if you knew about it right now. Some of you are familiar with Corrie ten Boom, the lady who is the, the heroine of The Hiding Place. And you have seen my brother's film, Return to the Hiding Place. But Corey tells the story of when she was a little girl, how uh, she asked her father, and she was still very young, asked her father about some things about sex. And he paused for a moment, and he said, Corey, uh, would you please bring me that big suitcase or valise that's over there? And so she went over and she tried to pick it up and it was really full of books or something really heavy. And she said, I can't, it's too heavy. And so he said to her, well, Corey, um, the answer to that question is too heavy for you right now. When you're bigger, you can pick up the suitcase and when you're bigger, I'll be able to answer that question for you. God doesn't give us more light because it may be too heavy for us right at this moment. He wants us to obey the light we've got right now so that we can get stronger so that when he gives us the next light, we'll be ready to go with that. You're never tempted with that which you are not able to bear. God will with the temptation also make a way to escape, but he never gives you something that is too strong for you right now. That's 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. So if we will learn to obey the light that God gives us in the present, then the future will open up for us in a very beautiful manner. And you know, the quicker you obey the light, the more you get light down the road. And if you're only going to live, say, 10 more years, and some of us may not live that long, just think, you keep hanging back now, you'll only get maybe another two or three steps down the road. But if you obey the light you've got now, and then you obey the next light you've got, and then you obey the next light you've got, and then you obey the next light you've got, and pretty soon you're running with the light, how far will you be down the road ten years from now? And how much more will the heavenly rewards be for you that are laid out there at the wedding feast of the Lamb? Ah, dear ones, don't, don't hesitate in the race. That's why Paul, at the end of his life, was able to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. That's a race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord shall give unto me at that day, and not unto me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. You live every day in light of the imminent return of Christ. What a difference it makes when we don't drag our heels, when we don't pout and sulk and cross our arms and stubbornly refuse to move forward with what we know we ought to do. How much more blessing, blessing, blessing there is for immediate obedience. You know, that's been a tough lesson for me to learn through life. I tend to like to putter around and think about it for a while and then wonder about it for a while and then sit on it for a while and then sleep on it for a while and, you know, all the things that we do. But as soon as you know the will of God, you need to do it. You need to do it. Immediate, precise obedience. That was the principal lesson that we learned from our preceding text. That's the way we expect our children to be. That's the way that God expects us to be. It produces worship. And that's the correct response for all three foundational areas, doctrinal teaching, biblical discipline, and God-fearing example, so that our children, the next generation, will see that in us, and they will learn it not merely with their heads, but they will have seen an example in our lives of what to follow. Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. He didn't just say, Jesus set down the following doctrinal principles, and I want you to learn those. He said, be followers of me, imitators of me. I'm an under pattern. The light shines through me. You can trace your life around my life. And when you see that in your life, you will know that you are reflecting Christ because I'm a follower of Christ. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's obedience. That's lifestyle. That's tracing a pattern that shows up visibly 
in your life as it has in the generations of Christians who've gone before us all the way back to the days of the apostles and back to our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Those lessons are being taught here in our text in Exodus. Doctrine truly believed always results in a changed life. Romans 12 is what we looked at to see that application where Romans 12 applies the principles that we're learning over in the book of Exodus. It teaches the specific ways that teaching doctrine, believing doctrine, obeying doctrine does at least three things in your life. Number one, it transforms, that is it metamorphosizes your life. That's the word that Paul uses there in Romans 12. That you be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that's metamorphosis. The same word that's used, the basic root word for the metamorphosis of a worm or a caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. Same creature, but utterly transformed. Before bound to earth and destructive and suddenly free to fly and beautify all of the flowers as it pollinates them. It instructs your life. Number two, it instructs your life in the exercise of your spiritual gifts to the edifying of the church and the gaining of spiritual rewards. I hope you want spiritual rewards. Until you gain the, the desire for the spiritual rewards, you're not going to be using your gifts. I remember years and years and years ago, and indeed it was years ago that I was a runner. <laughs> I'm a walker now, but not a runner anymore. How much... I wanted to win the prizes. And we competed in some very big events, sometimes with more than 600 guys on the starting line, some of the cross-country races, sometimes in very, very important locations, West Point Military Academy, running against the Army itself, running in the Eastern States Championships, running the Penn Relays, I ran a lot of races. You know what? You know the reason that I went through the pain of training? Where we ran in rain and sleet and hail and high winds. Only thing our coach wouldn't let us run in was an electrical storm. And we only had one of those in the entire five years that I was eighth grade through twelfth grade at Stony Brook. You know why I did it? Because I wanted to win the prize. And what trivial prizes those were that I ran and won compared to the prize and the prizes that we get in heaven. The greatest of which is, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Can you hear? Any words greater than those from the lips of the God of the universe who created you and gave you life? Do you not want the prize? I do. And it informs every moment of my waking life. Doctrine truly believed always results in a changed life because it instructs your life in the exercise of your spiritual gifts to the edifying of the church and to the gaining of spiritual rewards. And finally, and how wonderful this is, it makes a lasting impact on the surrounding world for the glory of Christ. God didn't put us just to be here, we are his servants. We're not always serving as we should, but in the book of Revelation it says, and his servants shall serve him. What a joy to serve that kind of a master. In the Old Testament, there was what was called a bond slave. Ebed Yahweh, the servant of Jehovah.
Israel had various servants. Some of them were gained through war. Some of them were gained as a result of having gone into debt and not being able to put their pay their debt. But there would come a time during the year of release, the Jubilee, when they would be released and their bond slavery or their slavery would be nullified. But a man might look at it and say, you know, back when I was free, before I went into debt, for example, I was having a hard time providing for my family. And perhaps even during the time of his slavery, he, the master had given him a wife and he'd had children. He says, you know, my wife, my master has been very good to me. He's provided for me better than I could have ever provided for myself when I was on my own. I used to work a whole lot more hours than I have to work for my master. My master is a good master. I will not go out free. And so he would go and tell his master, even though I can be released, I want to be your slave forever. And the master would take him down to the, in the wilderness, the tabernacle, or later to the temple. And there at the doorpost of the tabernacle or the temple, the priest would take an awl and bore a hole through the ear of this man and place a signet of the owner in that man's ear. And he would be that man's slave for the rest of his life because he said, I will not go out free. That proved that he had a master who was a good master, a master who loved him and cared for him. You know, that's what the New Testament calls us. We are douloi. We are bond slaves of Jesus Christ. We have a good master. And because we love him, we say, I will not go out free. I want to serve him for the rest of my life. Do you merely want the benefits of salvation without the joyful service of salvation? You still want him to provide for you, but you want to go out free and do your own thing. That's not the attitude of a douloi, of a doulos, singular, douloi, plural. Remember, doctrine truly believed transforms your life. It makes a lasting impact on the surrounding world for the glory of Christ. It gains for you eternal, heavenly rewards. It metamorphosizes your life. And God will take you as you are. We talked all about that, how God is not waiting for you to reform yourself. He takes you as you are. But the transformation occurs here in Romans 12. We see verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You and I have been given as an illustration of what it means to be in the center of the perfect will of God. We're supposed to be reflecting that to the world. Instead of being squeezed into the world's mold, we are to be transformed. We are to be reflecting the perfect will of God. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. You don't have to say to yourself, Well, I can't know the will of God. Nonsense. You have the mind of Christ. Because you have the indwelling Holy Spirit who makes intercession for you with groanings which cannot be uttered. And the Holy Spirit knows what is the mind of the Father. The Holy Spirit knows what is the character of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us into the image of Christ. We have no excuse. What stands in the way is our own stubborn, selfish will 
our own carnality, our own flesh, our own following after the things of the world, our own obedience to the devil, the enemies of our soul, instead of submitting to our master and saying, not my will, but thine be done. Do you have a vision of the future? Do you have a vision of heaven? Do you have a vision of the eternal rewards? Are you pressing with all your power toward the prize, toward the goal that is set before you? Why do you think Jesus died for you? Why will we celebrate the Lord's table in a few moments? Why did God give to the Jews the commandment of Passover forever? If not to point to the sacrifice that he made for us. What petty, paltry sacrifices we make for him. Ah, uh, that we might learn to think like Christians and that it might reflect in the way in which we live. And then I closed the last time we were here in Exodus by reading Romans 12 without comment, but as I read, I suggested that you ask yourself, how does this apply to me? In addition to the spiritual gifts listed in that chapter, and we've talked about the various places in the New Testament where the spiritual gifts are listed, we find those, a total of 22 of them, seven of which were temporary gifts given only during the apostolic period when there was new special revelation being transmitted to the church, but 15 still available today. But I also pointed out that Romans chapter 12 has at least seven other lists. I suggested that you try to find them. Number one, all the spiritual motivations. Number two, all the spiritual attitudes. Number three, all the spiritual actions. Number four, the spiritual results that you can expect when functioning correctly. Number five, the spiritual responses that are pleasing to God. Number six, the resulting spiritual deferences. Not differences, but deference. You know what deference is. Deferences and seven, the spiritual application of this chapter to the real world around us in which we live. <laughs> Some of you came up afterwards and got those written down. Some of you didn't. But some of you did. Some of you actually managed to get all seven of them when I went over them. Now I'm going to ask for something, and I don't want to embarrass you, but I sort of do. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have studied Romans 12 since March 13th and tried to find any one of these seven lists? Hmm. Why do I preach? Well, I preach because Jesus told me to. See, my preaching is not a matter of am I getting results or not. My preaching is because Jesus said to do it. It's obedience. You know, we had 21 days since I gave you that list. Those seven different lists, actually. 21 days ago, certainly enough time to give at least a cursory look at Romans 12. Dear people, if you don't apply what you hear here, you are still held accountable for it. It's not what I preach, it's God's word. I merely give you some guidelines so that you can find things for yourself. And so the Holy Spirit can apply them to your heart. Don't examine somebody else, examine your own life in light of that passage and ask yourself the question, how am I doing? Then we looked at the practical application of what we should do in light of the impending national crisis of God's judgment and rising persecution here in the United States. We saw what the children of Israel did. The passage teaches us what they should do in preparation for the judgment of God that's about to fall on any nation. It also shows us what the children of Israel failed to do in preparation and how God gave certain things to them in the Passover narrative to remind them about these failures so that it wouldn't happen again when national judgment falls, as it will during the Great Tribulation period. Now, we'll be out of here before then, 
a judgment is coming for national Israel, and God gave them the Passover and gave them those clues in this passage as to what they should do. First we saw, and this is practical for any nation, for the believers in that nation, they took the food that they had. The people didn't took their dough before it was leavened, it says. Preparation for a national disaster requires food. God didn't start providing manna that night. It didn't happen for a long time, after they were already across the Red Sea and into the wilderness. Second, it appears that they really didn't expect judgment to fall and deliverance to happen. They had to take the dough before it was leavened. They hadn't prepared even one day in advance for what was about to happen. They didn't have a storehouse full of bread that they'd prepared to make sure that they could get all the way to the Red Sea and all the way across and have something for a couple of days on the other side. After the first couple of plagues, the urgency of expectancy had faded. The excited anticip anticipation had turned to cynicism. They probably thought, yeah, God will send judgment sometime, but it won't happen anytime soon and not in my life. And, you know, we'll just sort of go along with the status quo. Don't think that way, folks. When judgment falls, it is swift. Third, they not only took food, but they took the means for preparing food. They took their kneading troughs, it says specifically. How are you prepared if national judgment fell today? You know, we had winds up to 55 miles an hour last night. Had a bunch of, branch, bunch of branches down over in the manse uh, yard off the trees. I'm glad we took down a, uh, several trees a few days ago because I suspect some of those might have actually fallen. But God enabled us to get some dead trees down and the stumps ground out so they wouldn't hit either the manse or the house that's next to the manse. They're right between the two. And some pretty heavy winds went through there. And from the trees that remained, I took down a branch that was about 20 feet long that was on the ground this morning and dragged it over to the dumpster, as well as some smaller branches that were down on the ground. When judgment falls, it'll be like that. It'll be swift. Are you prepared? Number four, they took clothing, and they didn't have a lot. It says being, their clothes being bound up in, on their backs, on their shoulders, it was like a backpack for them. Number five, they obeyed the word of God through Moses exactly. That, of course, goes back to what we've just been talking about, and our time is almost up here. They'd been slaves for almost 400 years. But you know what? They obeyed exactly, and God told them, to borrow from their captors, and that made them rich. The children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. They borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. It was like a, a forced savings account that they'd had for 400 years. You know, one of the basic financial principles of the New Testament is being debt-free. I hope you are. Because if you're not... When judgment falls and you have no money, you will be out on the street. God blessed them from that point on, and they are still some of the wealthiest people on earth. But on that night, they obeyed him specifically, and that's what God blessed them with as a result. Obedience on one specific item or at one specific time will result in blessing for yourself and for your descendants. Exodus chapter 20, verses 5 and following, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, speaking of the pagan gods, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now praise God that he limited it. Because if all of us went back that many generations, we'd probably find some God-haters in our ancestry. But he limits it to the third and fourth generation. Verse 6 says, And showing mercy unto the thousands, in that context it's the thousands generations, of them that love me and keep my commandments. You know, a number of studies have been done on the generations, the descendants, of godly men and wicked men in the past history of the United States. And it is amazing to see how generation after generation after generation has been blessed 
by those who are the descendants of one godly man in the past. That was done with Jonathan Edwards. That was done with some of the other wicked people uh, in our nation's history. And the curses and all the horrible things that happened to the descendants of those who led publicly wicked lives in the past versus those who stood for righteousness in the space of, a face of opposition and persecution. Exodus chapter 34 tells us the same thing. That was Exodus 20 I read. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, giving, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and fourth generation. God has set a pr principle up. He says it again in Deuteronomy. You know, that's, that happens to be something God repeats multiple times, so you better pay attention to it. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Now, I'm going to close with this, but I do want to make this final point since I just mentioned it. If you're debt free, you'll be able to leave either at the rapture or if you have to flee with no chains of slavery binding you to earth or binding your children after you. You're not rich just because you have a lot of stuff. Anything that you owe money on does not belong to you. It belongs to the bank or to the lender until you pay that last miserable cent. And you know they can take it away from you anytime they want. The New Testament puts the command to be debt free in a triple negative, Romans 13:8. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. There's a triple negative in the Greek, which is don't owe anything, no, not to anybody, nothing at all, but to love one another. When God tells us something with one negative, we need to obey it. If it's a double negative, you really need to obey it. If it's a triple negative, you know that he means business. Now, I want you to think about this. You know, we've just looked at Romans chapter 12. It's interesting that this, owe no man anything, is one of the very first commands that Paul gives to Christians at Rome right after he's given them Romans 12. This is Romans 13. One of the very first things he tells them in terms of applying what he has just taught them in Romans chapter 12, which we've just surveyed, is don't be in debt. What is the practical application of Romans 12, of presenting your body as a living sacrifice? What is the practical application of exercising your spiritual gifts, of applying the seven lists of principles that I gave you? One of the principal changes that it will make in your life relates to your money. It means that you will get out of debt and remain out of debt. You will be debt free. That's one of the very first things he tells you after he gives you that magnificent Romans 12 passage. By the way, let me just say one other thing. Obedience does not mean that it's going to make you rich. Because the heroes of faith are known not only for their greatness, but also for their suffering. You recall that last Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, which the world calls Easter, the morning message was entitled, Faith and the Better Resurrection, and our hate text was Hebrews 11.35. Notice what follows immediately on the heels of verse 35. Verse 35 says, Women receive their dead, raised to life again. Man, that's magnificent. But then it says, and others. They're all heroes of faith, but and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trials of cruel mockings and scourging. They didn't all get rich. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment, yet they were all heroes of faith. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. You say, that's terrible. Well, you know what God says? Of whom the world was not worthy. Whose commendation do you want? The world or God's? Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, not just the guys who had the great victories in the first half of the chapter, but also those in the second half of the chapter. These all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, 
Verse 40, this is us if you believe and obey what we've just been studying. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Oh, we have so much more to say about this particular text today. Passover forever. What does the Passover accomplish in your life? Is it only your salvation? Or is it the foundation and ground for living for Christ? Oh, that we might gain the vision of the future. We have no idea how long we're going to live. But we know that someday we'll stand before the one who judges the race. The one who hands out the rewards. Who will show us his hands and his side and his feet. The one whom we'll worship for all of eternity. Oh, how I want to hear the words. Well done. Not well thought. Not well imagined. Not well hoped for. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. A doulos. A bond slave. One who has a loving master who says, I will not go out free. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your beautiful word. It is a lovely word. It is a powerful, undergirding word. It is a gracious word. You are a loving master. Oh, that we might view you as such. Judgment is guaranteed. But the way of escape has been made for us through Passover. Through the Passover lamb. The one who transforms our lives, not merely rescues us from danger. The one who empowers us the one who gifts us, the one who gives to us opportunities for service, joyful service, and the one who promises us eternal rewards. Father, teach us to live for him. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today in preparation for the Lord's table.